Hello everyone. Today I am making a video that I have thought about for a long, 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 long time. I initially planned on getting this out earlier, but uh, this little thing called the Eras Tour actually got in the way of me making this video and having it out for you. So yeah, I hope you can forgive me. I was just having the time of my life. I'm definitely gonna make some kind of video about that in the future, but today we're gonna be talking about a little song called <laughs> Me, featuring Brendan Urie by Taylor Swift. <laughs> On the 26th of April, 2019, Taylor Swift released a single that should have been one of her most impactful releases of her career. This single marked her newfound freedom since exiting her contract with Big Machine Records. After having her masters sold, which was the catalyst to her starting her whole re-recording journey that we've kind of been watching over the last few years. It was the first single to promote the 2019 album Lover and it would be featuring prominent artist of the time, Brendan Urie of Panic at the Disco. We're gonna get into that. But uh, unfortunately, me has a reputation, reputation for being Taylor Swift's worst song. It's in pretty well every article that lists her worst songs, as if that's really a thing. Worst of mm, the greatest pieces of art of all time. So let's keep it in perspective. In all of those listicles, it pretty well always features it dead last. Despite the disdain for this song, clear disdain for this song, this song was given a pretty big rollout. Like I mentioned before, it was the first single since her leaving Big Machine Records and moving to Republic Records. And they created an abstract and bright and fun music video to go along with the single's release. The song featured a then prominent artist and it was also the focal point of Miss Americana, a new documentary that kind of talked about that period of time in her life. This documentary was to premiere at the Sundance Film Festival of 2020. Based on watching Miss Americana, Taylor Swift loved this song, or at least was pretty confident in it being successful. A few months after the song's release, Taylor's team decided to actually remove some of the lyrics from the song because they were deemed too controversial. And I know that you might be thinking, well, what on earth were those lyrics that would have been removed? What would be too controversial for Taylor Swift? What would be something that she would create and then be deemed too controversial. Taylor Swift, by and large, one of the most unproblematic people to grace the world, literally marketed as being America's ideal person, right? What, what could she possibly be saying that could be construed as controversial? I'm nervous, actually. I'm nervous to admit this to you. I'm nervous to say to all of everyone in the class what those lyrics were because I do fear the big yellow dollar sign. I do fear it. Just for the sake of being honest and open and keeping history factual, the lyrics here that were removed were... Spelling is fun! Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, I, I'm, uh... Not sure. I'm not sure about that. Um, mm. The only terribly controversial thing about this song in my humble opinion, is the feature on this song, Brenda Neary. Might be a little harder for Taylor's team to remove him from the song though. So I understand why they went with just that sentence. So the only terribly controversial thing about these lyrics, at least in my opinion, is that they were cringy. You know, but this isn't the only time in Taylor's career that they've had to amend something that was in a song. Most recently, I believe we saw this in the anti-hero music video where Taylor stood on a set of scales and as she got on the scales read fat, which, you know, to normal people, we understand why she's done this. You know, Taylor, a typically very slim individual, tall, slim, to some people, ideal body shape, but we all know the media. And we know how the media will still call beautiful people fat as a negative assessment of someone. I could definitely make a whole video about why this change was unnecessary. Being mid-sized as well, I think I'd have uh, a lot to say on the whole decision of her doing it and having it removed and all these kinds of things. But I won't go into that in this video. I want to stay on 
We're talking about me today. But yes, some critics appreciated me. Swift veers away from her normally specific songwriting to instead offer up an anthem of self-love. I'm the only one of me, baby that's the fun of me, is about as universal as it gets. And while it doesn't hit the emotional notes of her more memorable work, it makes a strong statement. Me isn't just a pop song. It's a momentary escape that we all need. Others had some less complimentary things to say about the song. Me is a cloyingly goofy Disney pop confection with an earworm chorus and a certain try-hard insidiousness to it that America has come to love or at least tolerate. This star's first single since Reputation has almost none of the elements that once made her interesting, but it does have a dolphin screech in the chorus. The Ringer, huge fans, huge fans of me. Also. That's fucking so rude. <laughs> I hear the things that critics say and I'm just like, do you know that you're talking about another person? You would not say that to her face. Like, let's just tone down that critique a little bit, all right? We're being a little bit too sensational in this moment. That's coming from me, one of the most dramatic people, maybe ever. With all of that said, it was still a very successful song. As of me filming this, the song has over 820 million streams on Spotify and over 420 views on YouTube, making it her 14th most viewed music video on the platform. The music video also broke records. <laughs> it was the most viewed Vivo video on the platform in the first 24 hours and it has won several awards, including two MTV awards for best video and best visual effects. On paper, me was successful. Millions of people listened to the song, it made a lot of money, but even now it's not very well liked. And I'd like to get to the bottom of that. I controversially tweeted out that for the Eras tour, my wish list of surprise songs included me. Specifically, <laughs> I wanted the transition on guitar, a mashup, because we were getting mashups in Australia, I'm sorry. I wanted mean to me. That's my dream. Could you imagine? Why you gotta be so mean? <laughs> Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Taylor Swift, if you do this to a city later on, I'm about to unstand. <laughs> Anyway, let's get to the bottom of this. So the start of the music video follows a pastel snake slithering across rainbow cobblestones until it strikes the camera and explodes into a cloud of butterflies, symbolizing the end of the reputation era and the beginning of the lover era. We follow one of the snake butterflies into the window of an apartment where we find Taylor Swift and Brendan Urie arguing in French. When this song came out, I was just off of the back of exiting my PhD in French literature. And I, I, I hated this scene. Actually, still to this day, and now, you know, better verse Swifties maybe need to weigh in for me. I don't know why it did need to be in French of all things. It might have just been she was for the sake of doing it in French. But as far as I know, and as far as being now very familiar with her work, I don't understand the reference of it being in French. Editing pastel here. Apparently the argument and French references might be to one, a Taylor Swift thing and two, a Panic at the Disco thing. So at the start of But It's Better If You Do music video, Brendan and his partner are arguing before he goes out and starts the song. And the French part about it is where Begin Again was set. Now it might sound like a crazy connection to make, but that's the best that I've been able to make so far. If anyone has any better ideas, please, 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 please let me know in the comments. Brendan says to Taylor, en français, you need to calm down. Oh, it's egg. And Taylor responds, je suis calme. Exiting the room, she looks disheartened. And then the tone suddenly shifts as she composes herself and sings, I promise that you'll never find another like me. She walks across a large foyer filled with clouds, including a snake-shaped cloud, which attacks her, but doesn't injure her. Oh, I know what that's about. She finishes the scene saying, there's a lot of cool chicks out there. And then we cut to Brendan Yuri sitting in a room with a wall covered in paintings of chicks with sunglasses. Cool chicks, guys. And there's also a painting of the chicks teasing the song Soon You'll Get Better with the chicks on the Lover album. Wow, that's two Easter eggs in like the first 10 seconds. Amazing. She leaves the building in the most 
iconic outfit ever. I can't express this pastel suit is everything I could dream of. I still think about this outfit every day. I said this in my What to Wear to the Eras tour outfits video. This is, I think, one of the most perfect outfits that you can wear emulating one of her looks because it's so fun and silly. So this is an Easter egg for the man and we didn't even know. They start moving and grooving and Brendan looks down on them, debating whether or not he should join them, ultimately deciding to join them. Travelling through the air like Mary Poppins, umbrella in hand, a suit adorned in floral print. He lands on a unicorn-shaped Eve with Taylor sitting, her dress acting as a waterfall mane. And behind her you see Lover, name of both album and song. <laughs> Brendan tries to make it up to Taylor by presenting her with traditional gifts, a bouquet, a ring, but none of these things interest her. He then offers her a cat, which she gleefully accepts. And for newer fans, you may recognize this cat as Mr. Benjamin Button Swift. Yes, this is the music video <laughs> where she met this cat and then said, I'll have that. Oh my God, I'm to get out of here. And the rest is history. If you want to watch the behind the scenes video of this music video, it is literally all about her adopting this cat. There's no behind the scenes of the music video for anything else. It's just her adopting the cat, which is so iconic of her. <laughs> so iconic of her. <laughs> With Taylor's acceptance of his love, he opens his heart revealing the psychedelic, happy, fun stage where the chorus plays. And I'd like to imagine that to this day, if you were to crack open Brendan Urie and open that little heart door, you could still hear the chorus of me playing. <laughs> Then comes the most controversial thing that Taylor Swift has ever said. Spelling is fun. Taylor Swift could have been responsible for the literacy of American children everywhere. And yet we had to take that all away for a little bit of cringe and now we have an illiterate Gen Alpha. Is it time for all of us to shut our little mouths? Just let Taylor do what she needs to do. Let's not hinder her anymore. Taylor and Brendan dance in marching outfits in the colors of the Lover album, letting us know for the first time that you can't spell awesome without me. You're welcome, America. In the final scene, we see Brendan and Taylor dancing around at night. Taylor's wearing a dress made out of liquid pastel sludge, and Brendan is throwing paintballs of the same substance in the background. It kind of looks like what happens when you're at a child's birthday in summer and the Freddo cake sits out for just a little too long. He brings out an umbrella to shield Taylor from the mess that he's made. And they sing the last line of the song that matches the first line, I promise that you'll never find another like me. In the documentary, Miss Americana, Taylor speaks about how she wants to show people the things that make each of them uniquely them. Whatever makes you, you. Yeah. Emo kids, theater, <laughs> dance sequences, La La Land, everything. Nailed it. When it's like V-E-E, -E, it's like dancers, cats, gay pride, people in country western boots. She wants the song to be about individualism and self-empowerment and Coming off of the back of the Reputation album, an album born of revenge, this all kind of really makes sense narratively. Taylor continuing the process of healing from the trauma that brought on that album. I actually really like this music video. It's really fun. It's really silly. It is very clearly not taking itself seriously. I think a lot of things shaded me understanding that element of it when it came out. I was definitely in my pick me era. Let's just say I would constantly talk down things that were basic interests that were popular at the time to seem more interesting to men. I'm saying this and admitting this knowing that this is wrong, obviously, and this is harmful to women. I'm saying this because I've grown and know that I recognize this is wrong. Okay, so when I admit this to you in a vulnerable moment, just know this isn't me anymore and that's why I'm able to recognize that this was wrong. Okay, okay, it was hard to say. It was hard to say, am I going to edit it out? No, I won't. I'm going to be brave. <laughs> So you have to be nice to me. And I guess not being super familiar with Taylor Swift's kind of work in a more recent capacity at that time, I didn't understand a lot of how unserious that she was. You know, my more recent knowledge of her other than Blank Space and Shake It Off was Red. Red was kind of the era that I stopped, that I petered out of listening to her actively. I had seen her as being pretty... 
I mean, listen, we're never ever getting back together and I knew you were trouble. They're not very serious looking music videos, but coming off of All Too Well, Treacherous, you know, all these beautiful songs, Dear John, you know, thinking about those kinds of songs and thinking about how serious they were and then coming into me. So pardon me. <laughs> For expecting a little bit more seriousness. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know it was wrong. I know it was wrong. Anyway, enough padding aside. <laughs> I just didn't like this. We can all grow and maybe some of us need to do a little bit more growing to understand the me music video. <laughs> that just might be a cultural thing we have all got to go through. So as a self-admitted pick me girl in 2019, I was too busy talking about how I couldn't believe that Brendan Urie debased himself enough to be in this music video and in this song. And I actually have gone into the archives of my Instagram stories and seen what I originally said. And I can't even begin to tell you how embarrassing it is to look through this and go, oh, oh, do you ever look at something you did and go, that was so wrong? Because that was me. That was me, he, he, going through my Instagram stories and seeing this. <laughs> Nothing makes me cringe more than saying that Brendan Urie was the good part of this song, especially now knowing everything that I know. But anyway, as much as I like the music video, I think there are definitely parts that I don't think work and in my opinion are more of an eyesore than was originally intended. I'm looking at you, paintball dress. <laughs> I know that the paint that they were going for in this scene was definitely meant to emulate the kind of pastel aesthetic that they were going for with this album as a whole. It kind of looks like they were in the middle of making an oil slick kind of texture and then they didn't go far enough with the animation to make it look like that and they just went, ah. It looks a bit meh, but it's only like a 10 second part of the music video. So wow, only one bad part and one super controversial part. Oh. But I think overall, it's really easy to understand why it won awards. It's just very fun. They were doing something fun and silly and they had a high budget. They were being creative. They were cooking. So why on earth do people hate this song so much? Or, you know, maybe not hate it, but it's something that people are unable to keep their negative opinions deep within them for. They have to express their opinions on this. Why is that? Let's have a look at it, all right? Let's go step by step through why I think people didn't like this song. <laughs> As a connoisseur of cringe, I was surprised that this wasn't an instant hit for me. I'm a millennial. I existed on Tumblr. Taylor Swift's interests mimicked mine. So I don't understand why this wasn't an instant hit for me. The lyrics are very simple. They are very cheesy and they don't have any depth really. You know, you could hear the first verse and then the chorus and you would have the whole story of the song. The song doesn't really take you on any journey. And just for fun, I wanted to calculate how many times in the song me, Taylor Swift and Brendan Neary sang me. And the song was just over three minutes. Taylor Swift says me 26 times, which makes one me every seven and a half seconds. It's also got a super standard chord progression and I had to get my music theory knowledge out for this one. So I hope that you all appreciate the lengths that I went for this song. It's got your typical C to A minor, F to G chord progression. Other songs in Taylor Swift's library that have this chord progression are Sparks Fly, Back to December, Mean, All Too Well, All You Had To Do Is Stay, The Man, I Don't Wanna Live Forever. I don't wanna live forever. Yep. <laughs> and Betty. Taylor Swift is obviously not the only connoisseur of this chord progression. This is a very classic chord progression. A lot of songs use this. I believe Baby by Justin Bieber uses this chord progression and tons that are more recent than that. This also is kind of a good example of how versatile it is. I don't think anyone could argue that any of these songs even sound remotely the same. A super popular chord progression doesn't really necessarily mean that any of these songs are basic. It's just something to note. It's very catchy and it evokes certain feelings, which is why a lot of artists use this chord progression. Me also uses a marching drum beat throughout the song and an earworm chorus that is very hard to get out of your head once it's in your head. I promise you this whole time I've been recording, the song has been playing. Mm -hmm. It just repeats a very generic idea over and over again. It doesn't progress, like I said before. The whole song is pretty much just saying, hey, I'm a little bit difficult. You know what? That's okay because there are other really fun parts about me and you'll learn to love 
all of me. That's it. So I totally understand where the criticisms are coming from, where if someone has gone from an all too well and enjoyed the heartbreak of that song and then hearing me, it kind of feels like a little bit of a joke. Understandable. But I also think that there's an argument to be made that not every song needs to be an all too well or a dear John or, you know, would have, could have, should have. Or you're losing me. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes songs can just be silly and fun and people can have silly fun times, okay? We don't need to all be bleeding hearts on the floor. We can calm down for a moment. And it doesn't mean that it takes away from her creativity or her talent as a artist, you know? One song that maybe isn't for everyone doesn't mean that she's shit now. Brendan Urie, like I said before, is the controversial part of the song that should have just been edited out. Brendan, he's attractive, he's a good singer, and that's where the compliments for him end. Drink the band up for one, two, three. Oh, you sound fucking great, man. You sound amazing. Ooh. At the time of this song's release, Brendan Urie was at the highest of highs, having just released the song High Hopes, Mama said. which completely flipped Panic at the Disco's image from being an emo band from Las Vegas to being a band that your mum knows because she's heard plenty of his songs on the Coles playlist as she's going grocery shopping. Mama said, a year after Me's release, Brendan Urie came onto fire for a plethora of criticisms. Reasons that I can't comfortably go into in this video, if you Google Brendan Urie controversy, there will be so many things that come up I can't even begin to tell you. So if you're not well versed in the topic, definitely have a little look into it if you're interested. Some of the allegations include inappropriate actions with minors, essay allegations with band members, and roadies and things like that. There's also instances of racism and transphobia and that's kind of the beginning of it. So definitely have a little look into it. You know, people can grow and change, but there are some things that I find it very hard to forgive and forget. So that's why I don't personally like him. And I think it's important for us all to be aware of these things that the artists that we enjoy do because you know, you can't separate art from the artist while they're still alive and profiting off of your support. So something to think about. I definitely think that from a retrospective point of view, a lot of people dislike the song because of his inclusion in it. I definitely understand that point of view and that's definitely part of what still has a little bit of disdain for me personally. Something really fun that we see in the Miss Americana documentary is Taylor playing around with the production of this song. It was not always thought of as being this, you know, pop anthem that it ended up being. Taylor played around with how she wanted to present this song a few times. And actually there was a moment of all too welling where she sort of wanted to turn this into a ballad. And there is a scene in the documentary of her playing around with the song on the piano. And then you say that you'll never find another like me. <laughs> really cool. You like it? Yeah. It sounds different than I thought it would on the piano. It almost sounds sadder. Mm -hmm. This is a completely different song to what was released. I love how it sounds with the stripped back production and I know a lot of other people have shared this opinion as well. I hope that she releases a live album of the Eras tour at some stage and includes the version of me that she performed in South America because it's really beautiful. And I was praying for her to play it as the air store for me, but she didn't. If I had only gotten this video out earlier, maybe she would have realized that there's at least one person in the audience who really would have enjoyed that surprise song. <laughs> but what I really like about this version of the song is it kind of changes the whole meaning of the song. What I like about it is instead of feeling like a fun and floofy pop song about, you know, like, hey, I'm how I am and I think that you're gonna still like me exactly how I am in all of my faults and all of my, my pros and cons, you know, all those kinds of things. It turns it into a song that is desperate. And I love that. It feels like she's begging her partner, like, hey, I promise that you'll never find another like me. I promise that 
you're going to love me and it is going to be worth it. Kind of in the way that peace in folklore is. If you're going to be in my life, I feel like there's a certain amount that comes with it that I can't stop from happening. Yeah. I can't stop you getting a call in the morning that says the tabloids are writing this today. I can't help it if there's a guy with a long lens camera two miles away with a telescope lens taking pictures of you. I can't stop those things from happening. And so this song was basically like, is it enough? Is the stuff that I can control enough? You might not be their best option for that, but is it still a deal they want to take? Yeah. Although not as beautifully written. I'm d pieces, uh, But in that kind of vein of writing, right? That's how I feel about the stripped back version of me. And it kind of makes sense why the lyrics then don't progress because the song is so desperate. And when you're in this begging the person that you love, or, you know, or are interested in to look at you and see you for who you are and see that there's, that you're worthy, not that you need male validation for worth or anything like that, but in that moment, you can't really go anywhere from that, right? There's, there, of course, there would be no lyrical progression because you're either going to be with them or you're not going to be with them and you're going to move on, right? But at, at this stage, there's nowhere to go. So you're just writing about this one part. So it completely makes sense why the lyrics don't go anywhere. And I love it, you know? I think in a way, if it had gone maybe down that route and it was released in that kind of way, potentially there would have been a different audience reception and we could have these fun little conversations about it. Now, I wanted to cap all of this off by saying something that I said earlier in this video. Taylor had made this song a focal point of her documentary, Miss Americana. It was also the first song that she was releasing after leaving an abusive contract and having all of her music stolen, which led to the re-recordings of her music. This was a pivotal moment in her career. So releasing a song that is unserious with all of that context gives the song an importance and a level of seriousness that Taylor never intended. So of course it was going to be scrutinized more harshly given that context. And I think that's maybe the only mistake that Taylor Swift has ever made. <laughs> The lead singles that, that Taylor usually releases prior to an album's release typically are songs that don't necessarily sound much like the other songs on the album. And they also tend to be directed at kind of the media and and the world at large rather than kind of a dear diary, which a lot of her songs are. Songs like Shake It Off, Look What You Made Me Do, Blank Space, all of these songs are directed at the media or directed at a public perception of her and directly talks to that public perception of her. If we wanna look at me like it's one of those kinds of songs, she could be talking about this and reclaiming her image, like her image coming off of 1989 and reputation, her, reputation was in tatters, right? Even though she was still wildly popular, she was seen as something completely different as what she had been seen prior to that time period. So me could have been a reclamation of herself. That's totally fine. But it also kind of breaks my heart then. And this thought, I didn't need to make myself cry right now over that little thought. Rewind. Yeah. It's rewind time. I definitely think giving me the first single treatment was a misstep in the release of this album. I think had they chosen this to be the second single, there would have been no issue with this song. I think people would have gone, yeah, it's a little bit cheesy. Yeah, it's a little bit meh, but they wouldn't have thought of it as one of her worst songs that she's ever released. Had she instead released You Need to Calm Down, which was also another big part of Miss Americana, I think that we would have taken both of those songs differently. You Need to Calm Down is also a song that is kind of directed to the public. It's directed specifically to conservatives who were at that time against the uh, same-sex marriage bills that were being talked about a lot in 2019. She wanted to be an ally. This was something that she was really passionate about. She'd never really gotten to speak her mind on this issue prior because she'd always been advised not to do anything too controversial, lest it dampen her image. I really, really care about my home state and I know that at this point in time, my home state is a huge, hugely important part of this midterm election. One of the things that like outraged me so much is that she voted against the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. And then obviously it's a no for gay marriage. It's a no for them to have any rights whatsoever. Part of the fabric of being a country artist is don't force your politics on people. Let people live their lives. That is grilled into us. 
I'm getting to the point where I can't listen to people telling me, no, stay out of it. People Taylor Swift comes out against Trump. I don't care if they write that. I'm sad that I didn't two years ago, but I can't change that. I'm saying right now that this is something that I know is right, and you guys... I need to be on the right side of history, Taylor, and if he Taylor. doesn't win, then at least I, I, at least I tried. It really is a big deal. She thinks that that if you're a gay couple, or even if you look like a gay couple, you should be allowed to be kicked out of a restaurant. It's really basic human rights, and it's right and wrong at this point. And I can't see another commercial and see her disguising these policies behind the words Tennessee Christian values. Those aren't Tennessee Christian values. I live in Tennessee. I am Christian. That's not what we stand for. So I think it would have been a really good statement had that been the first one because, yeah, in Miss Americana, she talks a lot about having her own voice, having her rights to her own music, having the rights to her own voice, having the rights to her own thoughts, being able to speak up more publicly and have it not ruin things for PR. So it would have been the perfect song to be first. It also is fun. The lyrics are a little bit more thought provoking and the music video is just as fun as me. So there's definitely a real argument for that to have been the first, the first single, you know, her being an ally for the LGBTQIA and kind of reshaping what it means to be the innocent all American girl next door that she had always kind of been perceived to be. Oh, to be tainted by liberalism. <laughs> so with all of that said, I think a lot of factors were at play in giving this song its wildly negative perception. Now that the dust has settled on a lot of things, bar Brenda Nero being an absolutely vile human being, I know a lot of people are starting to revisit me, especially with the Eras tour. I think it's giving a lot of people new appreciation for these songs that maybe we had a different opinion on when they first came out. You know, it's it's a goofy little pop tune. You know, it and Paper Rings have a lot in common, but somehow Paper Rings doesn't have the same treatment as this song. So... What I would really love in the future for this is for Taylor to re-record me, especially re-record it without Brendan Urie. That would be amazing. I would also maybe even love it as an acoustic version like we have seen on the Eras tour. I would love a, a, an Eras album of the live performances of a lot of these surprise songs that we haven't heard perform before. And, you know, not to be too parasocial here, but I think that now her being in a new relationship and all these kinds of things. Maybe there's not any anxiety anymore about how she feels with Travis now, but that could still be in the back of her mind and it would be understandable, I think, to the audience if she was to bring out a song like this again where maybe those feelings are returning in some kind of way, even maybe if not even in the same sense that they were once. Those kinds of things. You know, I'm just I'm just spitballing here. I just want the song. So yeah, you know, this song evokes happy little feelings. I love singing this song in the kitchen, singing it to my cat. And I, I, I now appreciate it a lot more than, certainly I did when it first came out, but I appreciate it and I understand its purpose. So I'd love to know your opinion. What do you think of the song, Me? Did you hate it when it came out? Did you love it now? Do you still hate it? Did you always love it? I'd love to know. <laughs> All of your opinions in the comments, please feel free to let me know. If you like this video, make sure that you give it a like. It was a lot of fun for me to make this. And I would love to make these kinds of deep dive kind of videos discussing the song, its context, more is something that I'm very passionate about. Thank you so much to my YouTube members. I really appreciate your support. I can't even begin to tell you how much I appreciate it. And I hope that you're all hydrated and healthy. And I guess I'll see you all next time. Thank <laughs> you.